I was invited by a church in Los Angeles in a neighborhood that used to be called South Central LA. It's now often called South Los Angeles. Uh, there was a church there that I had a friend who was the pastor of. Uh, we visited, they invited me to preach a couple of times because they heard that's a thing that I did. Um, and then invited me to join their staff. So this church is a historically black church in a part of Los Angeles that is historically a black neighborhood that was at the time, this is a long time ago now, was probably 50% uh, Mexican American and, and black, but very close to Koreatown. Um, very close actually to where the early 90s LA uprisings and riots kind of took off, right? So if you just walked a couple of blocks from the church building, there were still some burnt out buildings and things like that. So my mother is from Korea. Uh, I grew up in the Churches of Christ. This was a Church of Christ church. Uh, and they were interested in me uh, getting engaged in doing some racial reconciliation work between the historically black and historically Korean neighborhoods that kind of abutted one another and had a long history of various forms of tensions and things like that. And so uh, I joined the staff of this congregation, the ministry team to do that work uh, and was able to do some of it. But one of the other things that happened was quickly got engaged in some work trying to respond to various forms of gang violence that was happening in the neighborhood, in particular between um, predominantly Mexican-American, Mexican and Mexican-American, and African-American gangs, right? Um, and uh, at the same time, I was a seminary student. So I was pursuing my uh, seminary degree, writing a thesis, comparing the thought of Martin Luther King Jr and Desmond Tutu, both their lives and their thinking, kind of trying to do this public theology project, which is where I first, so simultaneously, I'm reading Desmond Tutu and he's talking about restorative justice from a theological lens in relationship to the work he did with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And I didn't fully have the language of restorative justice. I was learning it in my uh, ministry work, but I was connected to several folks who are doing what I would now call restorative justice. So local elders, in the community, mostly older women who are doing things that look a whole lot like what's often called victim offender um, conferencing or something like that in their homes, over kitchen tables, right? Somebody uh, has some instance of violence. Somebody's son got jumped when they were in the wrong neighborhood. Somebody caught a stray bullet. Somebody got involved with a series of drive-by shootings. Don't want the police involved. Don't want the violence to escalate. Different kinds of things happening. Uh, and I got connected to these community leaders who were doing this work, which then introduced me to the work of restorative justice. So that sent me on an intellectual journey, do my PhD in that general area, um, and have been wrestling with the questions that are raised by various practices of restorative justice for a long time. I have a question. Then. Is yeah. there a difference between transformative justice and restorative justice? Yeah, we'll get to that. Okay. <laughs> yes. So uh, so I'm doing that, and my general area my, is ethics, right? That's what I do my thing in, so I'm connected to the ethics world. Um, and then I find myself doing restorative justice work in uh, higher ed institutions and in community-based settings in various kinds of ways. And then this thing happens uh, in the world of theology and ethics, which is there's a, and kind of the broader field of like racial justice work, which there's a series of prominent people who begin advocating for an ethic of hopelessness. Um, and w in my area of Christian ethics, that person was uh, Miguel de la Torre, who teaches the Isla School of Theology, a very important um, contemporary social ethicist, um, who makes an argument, which you can read in the Power of Hope article, I kind of trace this out, makes an argument that uh, folks in marginalized and oppressed communities, especially communities of color in the United States, especially in Latinx communities, um, should embrace an ethic of hopelessness to allow them to disrupt uh, the systems that are in place that are oppressing uh, various communities. Um, and he's one of other voices. ta Coates makes a similar kind of argument. There's these other folks that I kind of trace and I get really concerned when this happens because I know kind of how seminary classrooms and Christian ethics work. Um, and there was a real concern of mine that this book, which was gonna get a lot of press, et cetera, 
was going to be the representative person of color voice on Christian ethics syllabi. And so people of color embrace hopelessness and that this is the way Christian ethics was going to be taught um, going forward. And I've since heard that, that folks have had syllabi where this is the thing. I said, no, 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 no. I've been reading these folks for a very long time. Uh, that doesn't feel accurate mm -hmm. to me, right? There's a whole host of folks across different racialized communities that have argued actually something like hope is what allows for liberatory work and praxis to happen. So I want to engage that argument directly. I want to have some voice in response to this argument that comes from a, someone who is a person of color to say this is not the only way POC think, right? That, that's really what I want to do. But one of the things that I argue in that um, is something like hope is not just a belief or a virtue or just a disposition that lives inside of ourselves. It's actually a practice that happens in community. And so then that's the work of the transformative justice mm -hmm. piece, right? I look at that as an, a very specific kind of case study of this in practice for a couple of reasons. One, I'm engaged in transformative justice work. So the basic uh, difference that is most salient to the difference between restorative justice and transformative justice is transformative justice typically is aligned with kind of a prison abolition politic and restorative justice with like a prison reform politic. But uh, even more specifically, transformative justice often works outside of dominant systems. There's a deep mistrust. These are the systems that are oppressing. We've tried to, right, this is Michelle Alexander, right? Uh, slavery turned into Jim, Jim Crow. Jim Crow turned into mass incarceration. Reform just means oppression takes new forms. And so there's a real skepticism to the possibility of reforming certain kinds of social institutions. And so transformative justice often has similar practices uh, as restorative justice when it comes to peacemaking circles, victim offender kind of mediations, various kinds of safety planning, but also paired with more abolitionist politics rather than reformist politics. So I'm engaged in some of that work in the midst of the lead up to, in the middle of COVID-19, Black Lives Matter, the spike in hate crimes against Asian Americans, especially on the West Coast where I was at the time, um, and I'm engaged in direct community organizing in transformative justice work, trying to respond to increases in gun violence among young men of color in Tacoma, Washington, the city where I'm from, predominantly Native American, African American, and Southeast Asian migrant communities. Right? So that's the work that I'm doing. And in that space, there's a really popular phrase that comes from Miriam Kaba, who's one of the most influential kind of theorists of transformative justice, which is hope is a discipline. So imagine me living in the world of Christian ethics, living in the world of transformative justice. The Christian ethics folks are saying, got to get rid of this hope stuff. And the folks on the ground, transformative justice folks, usually queer and disabled women and femme people of color who have experienced some of the greatest violence and oppression in this society saying, hope is the thing that we hold on to. It's the discipline we practice when we pursue abolition. And so I want to bring those things into conversation with one another and also learn from the practices, the lived ways hope shows up as this like communal practice of both resistance, yes, which is what De La Torre is concerned about, but also of construction, of building new worlds and making them come into being even in the midst of the resistance work. So it's less like linear, like you have to stop something from happening and then build the new thing and much more like you're doing all of that all of the time, um, and there's some, something kind of mutual happening in that space. 